Okay, so this is our physics talk. This is a two-part talk. Um, this will be the first part. I'm just going to sort of introduce how CT works, and then I'm going to hit on what I think is the most testable, um, or one of the most testable things, which is spatial resolution and contrast. Now, the thing is, well, in CT, this is probably actually more testable than artifacts, which is an exception to the rule. With MRI and with ultrasound, artifacts for sure are more testable, uh, more easily testable. But I think for CT, um, spatial resolution and contrast are probably number one, and artifacts are probably number two. So I'm going to cover artifacts in the second lecture. So let's get going. So just a real basic overview. There's a whole bunch of different types of scanners. I'm not going to get into which generation is what. I think that's, um, I'd be stunned if anybody would ask that kind of useless trivia. Though, who knows? Uh, but I do think it's low yield. Um, if you really want to know, you can Google it. The basic way it works is, you know, the patient lies on the table. The scanner spins and the table moves. Um, the detectors are very efficient. They're scintillation detectors. They obtain a ton of information, which creates a, a wavy mess called a sinogram. Then a whole bunch of math happens, um, which is, you know, the common thing is a filter back projection. And then you get a picture. So into the scanner, scanner rotates, table moves. So this is just sort of a, we're looking, we're going directly into the bore here. And the number of detectors in the axial direction determines the number of slices that can be simultaneously acquired. And probably the most important thing to know is that the minimum slice thickness is determined by the detector element aperture uh, width with regard to modern CT. This wasn't the, the case like first generation stuff, but like not 1960, the minimum slice thickness is determined by detector element aperture width. The skinnier they are, the, uh, the thinner the slices can be. So I sort of got that stuff going on. As the scanner turns, turn it again, shoot and turn it again. So that's, that's how that's what's going on. Of course, that's happening like super fast with lots of different things. That's a general idea. So I'm going to start introducing topics that, that are more high yield. Um, first one is this. So that's the scan, sort of the scan direction there. So this would be beam width, and this would be the table movement per tube. And you can, if you divide the table movement you know, over beam width, you end up with pitch. Pitch is a really important concept to try to understand, and I'm going to probably show this slide three or four different times during this talk, so you get used to seeing it. So if you have a pitch of one, that basically means there's no gap. And by gap, I'm talking about this right here. All right. So pitch is greater than so in a pitch greater than one, um, you're going to have a gap between slices. Um, if the pitch is one, there's no gap, and then if the pitch is less than one, you have overlap. Um, now, if you've got overlap, you've got more dose, and if you have a bigger space, then you have less dose. So there's going to be a dose element. If you overlap more, you've got the potential for improved spatial resolution. If you have a bigger gap, you have less spatial resolution. So just a general comparison between how conventional X-rays stack up with CT. CT runs at a higher MA, which requires a larger focal spot to avoid melting um, in general. Um, X-ray tubes, just like regular plain film, use tungsten targets. Uh, but because the MA is so high, they, um, they have like a rotating anode to keep it so it's not hitting the same one. And that's how it's more heat resistant. So the big difference is this. A uh, focal spot is not small like a mammogram focal spot would be. Um, the other thing is that the, the beam is very filtered. Uh, remember that, you're, you know, especially when you're using contrast, you're trying to hit it at a very specific K-edge. So one of the reasons that it's so highly filtered, or it's filtered in a special way, is that, like, imagine that this is a, somebody's abdomen, or this is somebody's belly, we're looking at a belly CT, and, you know, it's, you know, you're fat in the middle, right, most people, and thinner on the periphery. So it would be nice if you could have a homogeneous attenuation, or you can match your beam to that. And the way it's done is by using something called a bow tie filter. So bow tie filters are used to compensate for this uneven attenuation of the beam by the patient. Um, the filters attenuate less in the center and more on the edges. They're made of very low Z material, like, um, like Teflon, and the reason that they do this is so that there's not a big hardening difference. So what you end up with is something like this. So three reasons to use a bow tie filter. One, it compensates for this uneven filtration. Two, it reduces scatter. And three, it reduces dose. You don't need to give more out here in this thinner part. Now, um, let's take a look at this real fast. So there are collimations that occur prior to the beam getting to the patient, and then again after the patient prior to it getting to the detector. So the pre-patient collimation, which is done here, um, it is done to basically reduce unnecessary dose to the patient. The post-patient collimation, this one here, is done to reject the scatter that comes from the patient here, so you can improve the accuracy of your imaging. So something like that. Now, why would you collimate? One, it reduces unnecessary radiation, and two, it ensures good image quality. So, dose, image quality by reducing scatter. Now, what if you increase your beam width through the collimator? What if you widen your collimator out? Well, if you've got a bigger beam, fatter beam, uh, it's going to reduce the scan time because you're scanning more per turn. Um, it's more resistant to motion artifact um, because there's less scan time, there's less time to move. You know, with those super fast modern scanners, they often don't even give the patient breathing instructions because it doesn't they don't even have time. You know, you're talking about half a second or a quarter of a second, you're not, you don't have time to fire your, your diaphragm. Um, there's a potential for increased partial volume because there's more divergence of the beam. We're going to talk about partial volume effects in the artifact lecture. Um, it does not change the radiation dose, this is a key topic here. Um, even though the scan time is less, you're imaging a larger portion, so it compensates. So even if you make a, the beam fatter, the, um, the radiation dose does not change. And that's, if you remember anything, that's probably the thing that I would remember. So just some more vocabulary here. Got a projection, an array. So array is 
uh, the total X-ray attenuation along the line from the focal point to a single detector. So one, one detector, one line. A projection is all the rays in a given angle of the tube. In other words, a series of X-rays that pass through the patient in the same orientation. Um, the only real reason that I introduce these terms is that if I say there's more projections, then you would say there's better resolution. Why is there better resolution? Because you've collected more data. So, you know, more lines, more projections, better resolution. So how's the picture actually made? I mentioned that there's, um, you know, there's raw data that's acquired, and then there's this math that happens. So there's a couple different ways to do it. Back projection is the original way. This is where equal attenuation was given to all the pixels along the ray. Um, filter back projection is the more modern way. Um, and basically, it has a mathematical filter. Uh, multiplying different projections makes a better picture. It's more complicated. And then there's a new fad towards this um, iterative reconstruction. You may hear sometimes people call it ACER or adaptive statistical iterative reconstruction. There's a bunch of different brand names for it. But basically, the information is um, it's forwarded information compared with the actual information. And then the differences are used to correct the image. Essentially, this is the way that I understand it. It's a very basic way, is that um, it's better at correcting for noise. So you can lower your dose, which will make the imaging noisier. And then you use this iterative reconstruction, which compensates for the noise. Now, it's been around a long time, but it's only recently being employed because it requires so much computational power, and the older systems could do it, but they would just take forever. Um, but now stuff is faster, so it's there. So it allows you to lower the dose and allegedly maintain imaging quality, even though I think that these things look like shit most of the time. But there's a natural trend in fear of radiation. So, you know, you'd hate to radiate some 99-year-old guy on a head CT. That would be bad, right? So, so you can feel the sarcasm. It's just, that's, that's where things are going nationally. Okay, so um, what is the matrix size for CT? So, you know, you can change the matrix for MRI in, in depending, you know, it's a parameter that you can alter, but uh, the matrix for CT is usually 512 by 512. Um, and the matrix is in a calculation, which is another thing that's really important. So pitch is very important to understand. This is another thing that's very important to understand. This relationship of field of view, which is something you can alter, matrix, and pixel size. So when we acquire data in CT, it's not acquired in two dimensions, though. It's acquired in three dimensions. So it's less of a pixel and more of a voxel, which has a third dimension, it's depth, and that's your slice thickness. So um, a pixel is a square, a voxel is a cube. So how do you improve spatial resolution? Um, you know, you are going to make your field of view smaller, right? If you've got, what was that formula again? Pixel size equals field of view over matrix, right? So if we go down on this, that's going to make this go down as well, right? And a smaller pixel size is going to give you better spatial resolution. Well, why, is a bit, why is a smaller pixel size going to give you better spatial resolution? So think about it like this. Here's four small pixels. Um, we're trying to look at these two little bars that are close together. And then here's one big pixel. So with these four small pixels, we're going to be able to see that there's two different bars. We've got you know, one in each pixel here, and these two pixels are blank. Now this one here is a single pixel, and what's going to happen is it's going to get averaged together. It's going to look like one, so we couldn't tell apart. And that's what spatial resolution is. Spatial resolution is the ability to tell that two things that are close together are separate, as opposed to something like this, where these two lines are right on top of each other, and you'll say there's, there's only one of them instead of two. Right, so matrix up, pixel size down. Field of view could also be down, pixel size down. All right. So smaller voxels, larger matrix, or smaller field of view. Thin detector elements, was something I mentioned early on. More projections, smaller focal size. So larger focal size means um, the object details are spread out over several detectors, and that degrades and blurs the image. So smaller focal sizes are better for spatial resolution. The thinner detector elements um, equal better spatial resolution in the Z direction, right? We talked about that was the thing I mentioned very early on. Um, so again, what about pitch? So I mentioned that before. So if you've got high pitch or low pitch, um, so with high pitch, you're going to have a bigger gap more o or less overlap. And then with low pitch, you're going to have more overlap. So that's going to have less spatial resolution because you've got gaps in between, right? Thicker slices equals less spatial resolution. As pitch increases, so does the width of the slice sensitivity profile. That's a wording sometimes we hear, the SSP. As the slice sensitivity profile widens, slice thickness widens. And thicker slices equal less spatial resolution. So now let's, let's talk about a related thing, which is signal to noise or noise. So basically, um, noise is the amount of photons per voxel. So if you want to decrease noise, that requires increasing the number of photons absorbed per voxel. Now the downside of this is that that increases dose. So if you turn down the MA, you're going to have more noise because you're going to have less photons. So in other words, as the signal and proportionally the dose increases, so does your contrast resolution. Your signal to noise ratio is going to get better. So this is a topic that's, or this is a concept that's important to understand too. Doubling your X-rays doesn't just double your signal; it also doubles the noise. So they both go up, but the noise goes up by the square root of two. This goes up by two x. This gets doubled. So they're both going up, but this is going up at a higher rate than that. So it is improving your signal to noise ratio. And you may say, "Well, how is the noise going? Why is the noise going up?" It's a variation thing. It's, it's like standard deviations and stuff. So just it's there's math there. You don't need to understand it. Um, if you've got an engineering background and you want to actually see the math and have it understood, understand it that way, then look it up. But for everybody else, just understand that they both go up, but that the signal goes up more or at a faster rate. So. Decreasing noise requires increased photons per voxel. And like I said, the downside means increasing the dose. So 
if you've got four small voxels, you've only got two or whatever, two and a half per voxel. You have a big voxel. Now you've got 12 per voxel. So an increased voxel size um, is actually going to increase the number of photons per voxel, which will improve your signal to noise ratio. So one of the things you can do if you ever notice that you have very bad signal to noise ratio is thicken your slices. Um, now the other things you can do to mess with your pixel size, right, um, are you know, instead of making it small, you can increase your field of view, um, or you can decrease your matrix, theoretically so. Um, large matrix has high noise, small matrix has low noise. So here's an example of a, a CT scan that has a very thin slice. And what I've done here is I've progressively thickened the slice, so each click is a thicker slice, so a little bit thicker, a little bit thicker, a little bit thicker, a little bit thicker. You can see that that, and I'm going to go the opposite direction, thinner, 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 thinner. See how it gets noisier? And by noisier, I mean, see how grainy it looks? Less grainy, less grainy, less grainy. All I'm doing there is thickening the slice. So here's a side-by-side -side of a thin, the thinnest slice versus a thicker slice, and you can see it's much less grainy, right? So that's me reducing or increasing the, the amount of photons per, for, per cube, um, so that improves the signal to noise ratio. Now here's another thing worth talking about, which is this idea of a kernel. So what is, a, what is a kernel? So this is just um, a screenshot of a jacket from a PAX that I use, that we, that we use, and it's, um, you know, it's got your standard stuff for head CT, and you know, here's your scout, here's all the images, and then there's like two different ones. There's one bone, and there's one that's soft tissue, and I can remember being a first-year resident and thinking that they had just pre-windowed them for me, that this was windowing. Um, the bone window, I used to call it, there's the bone window, I'll pull the bone window over. I can also remember trying to like window for, to look for a brain tumor stroke or whatever on the, what was, what I would later find out was a bone kernel, and it looked all grainy, and I didn't understand what was wrong with it, so. Here's the sharp kernel, or the bone kernel. Here's the smooth kernel. And all I did was I changed it to a brain window here, brain window there, bone window here, bone window there. So you can see that how noisy this sharp kernel looks with a bone window on it, and how soft this smooth algorithm looks here on a bone window. So the reconstruction kernel, sometimes called a filter or an algorithm, um, is a parameter that can affect imaging quality. Now, what's actually happening here is a trade-off between spatial resolution and noise. The smooth kernel um, generates an image with low noise, but reduced spatial resolution. A sharp kernel generates images with high spatial resolution, but with increased noise. And the reason they're done is based on clinical parameters. So if you were looking for fracture uh, in the C-spine or anywhere, you would want a sharp kernel. If you're looking for small amount of blood or um, you know, tumor or whatever, so any kind of soft tissue finding, you know, it's better to have this your signal to noise ratio improved. So when does this actually happen? So here's sort of the timeline. Here's your detector. Here's your x-rays and your detector. And you know, then you've got the generation of raw data. Now, this raw data, like I said, it gets uh, converted based on, a, fil based on, based on a, a lot of math here, you know, filter back projection or uh, iterative reconstruction or whatever. And then um, a mathematical filter is applied, which is your kernel, and that determines your um, signal to noise ratio is, is messed with, and you either get soft or smooth kernels, and then you're ready to read or store the information. The windowing actually happens at the view box, right? So the take-home point is that those kernels are not, that's not a window. Uh, so what is a window? Well, before I get into that, I want to talk about another thing, which is what is a Hounsfeld unit. So on CT, attenuation is all relative. It's all relative, and it's compared to water. So you zero it. It's one of the QA things that's done with the CT scanners. They, they have a tank of water, and they scan the tank of water, and then they zero it. Like you zero a scale. The Hounsfeld unit, the actual formula that they use, is you know material minus water divided by water times 1,000. So the bottom line is um, it's zero to water, and it's relative. It is not. It is based on density, but the scale is you know based relative to water. Um, it's not like an inches and inches and inches kind of thing. It's all relative to something else. So and understand this relationship, too. What's the relationship between the Hounsfeld unit and X-ray attenuation? So, when you increase the Hounsfeld unit by 10, you increase X-ray attenuation by 1%. Just something to know. All right, so let's look at two different windows here. We've got a stroke window and a regular brain window. And at the bottom of the screen, a lot of times you'll see this W30, L30, you know, your window, um, or your, you know, your, your width and your level. So what does, that, what does that actually mean? So let me sort of draw this out. So your level is selected at the attenuation of the thing you're interested in. So white matter and gray matter around 30 and 35. White matter is a little bit lower. White matter is 30. And I remember that because it's got myelin on it. Myelin's fat, so it's a little bit less dense. Um, and the width is based on how close the things that you're trying to look at are from each other. So stroke, for example, is, you know, you see this cytotoxic edema that creates blurring of this gray-white differentiation. So because gray matter and white matter are so close together, you really need to have a tight window. Whereas, you know, if you were looking at something in the lung, the difference between air in the lung and a tumor is big. So you would want to have a very wide width. So let's just look at a problem here. So we got a window or width of 30 and a length of, or level of 100. So here's our grayscale. Everything's a grayscale. And 100 is right in the middle. And then 300 is how far we'll stretch. So if we divide 300 by 2, 150 of it will be on top, and 150 of it will be down below. So 150 plus 100 is 250. So anything above 250 is going to be white. 1,000 is going to be white, 300 is going to be white. And then anything below minus 50, and I got to that number by taking 150, which is half a desk, and going in this direction, is black. So that's a wide window. And then here we have a more narrow window. So still 100 is where we stick our center point, and then we're going to go 150 total span, so divided by 2, 75, right? So 75 added on the top comes to here. So anything at 175 or above is solid white, and anything below is black, and that allows us to get good contrast, either very narrow with sharp changes or very broad with gradual changes. 
So now it makes more sense why we would select such a tight window here and a little bit fatter there. And like a lung window is got a huge uh, range because the difference between air in lung and uh, a cancer here is it's really big. So summary slide, spatial resolution is improved with smaller pixels, more matrix or smaller field of view. Detector width, smaller is better. Oversampling or, or more information is better. More pitch is better. A sharp kernel or bone kernel is better for spatial resolution and a small focal spot. Now signal to noise or contrast, more x-rays, more photons per voxel. And we said larger, larger pixels or larger voxels, thicker slices, the smooth algorithm instead of, instead of the sharp algorithm. And actually using that iterative reconstruction um, is, improves that signal to noise ratio. Okay, so that's the end of this first talk, and the next talk is going to be on a brief introduction on dose, just talking about dose related to CT and then artifacts.